and I, we're very lucky to have Karen here. So let, take it away, Terry. Okay. Well, hi, everybody. Today's Paperworks uh, is pleased to welcome Karen Hanmer, who some of you may remember from years ago when she taught a workshop for us. But for those of you that weren't members at the time, Karen's a master book artist coming to us from Chicago. She's a fine book binder, artist, book designer, and teacher. She has received many awards and her work is in private collections, museum collections, and is shown widely. She's one of only 11 graduates in 30 years of the American Academy of Fine Book uh, Binding and her work encompasses many themes from social, political, historical, uh, serious, satirical, and more. And on her website, you will find uh, exquisite bindings and whimsical pieces such as her Monopoly board game, uh, Famopoly. So why don't you guys have a look at Karen's website. There's a link under programs on our website. Uh, and I will also post the link into our chat for you. So I'm sure you'll enjoy seeing her uh, impressive body work, uh, body of work. So welcome, Karen. Um, hi, everyone. And um, I'm going to begin my lecture by leaving the frame for a moment and closing my window because it just got really windy outside and really loud. So I'll be back. Okay. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Sorry for that surprise. That's okay. And um, thanks for that nice introduction, Terry. It's good to meet you and Bobby after corresponding with you all for so long. And um, Mara, like I've got a neighbor. That's great. I had no idea there was something in Highland Park. Yeah, um, I was here in 2007 with you in person. I did the lecture, two and a half day flag book workshop. Um, evening get together at Mabel Dean's. So um, the whole deal. So um, if any of you are there, it's great to connect with you again. And I'm gonna share my screen. So goodbye for now. There we go. My work weaves together history, culture, politics, science and technology, and the Midwestern landscape. My studio practice is unusually varied, including small editions of artist books, larger editions of inexpensive multiples, design binding, and book binding instructional materials. The work is informed by early years living among places significant to American history and later watching my engineer father slave over analog spreadsheets at the kitchen table. I grew up visiting relatives on farms in Southern Minnesota and observing film trips and museum exhibits on modern science and industry today that hadn't been updated since the 1940s. My liberal arts education gave me the tools to draw connections between the arts, sciences, history, popular culture, and current events. Service is also important to me for formal organizations, mentoring individuals, and connecting people and sharing information however I can. Today, I'll discuss each of these aspects of my practice plus talk about recent work and my COVID era activities. My family wasn't particularly interested in the arts. Family oil painting hung over the sofa and we had some fabulous bullfight prints over the mantle, but most of the culture I got was pop culture absorbed through television. I came to bookbinding through photography. At first, my interest was primarily in manipulating my father's camera equipment. I loved taking the lenses on and off, playing with the accessories, and fitting everything back into its appointed slot in his camera case. In high school, I took a photography class and set up a darkroom in the basement. Then after college, 
in my laundry room. About 25 years ago, I had a project in mind for three-dimensional structures that combine multiple images with text. I found Scott Keller, a binder and conservator in Chicago, to teach me some basic binding to make the simple case structures I had in mind. I liked how much more physically involved I could be in the process of making the work than I'd been with photography. And I liked that the viewer could also be physically involved while engaging with the work. Since then, I've rarely used my camera except to document my books. When I was still photographing, I worked on a series of photos of farms taken out the car window while my husband drove fast. The images were blurred in a way that seemed to convey the passage of time. I reused these photos, sometimes combined with old family photos for some of my first artist books. I use them again here in Mirage, a journey of both space and time across a Midwestern landscape. For this additioned work, I make eight or 10 books at a time, beginning with a stack of large photos. I cut the prints into quarters, then arrange them into sequences, so each book of the edition is a little different. Mirage is my first artist book using the drum leaf binding, a structure I continue to experiment with. It's ideal for photographers, printmakers, or anyone who has single-sided sheets to be bound. A Thousand Acres by Jane Smiley is a retelling of King Lear on an Iowa farm. She speaks very poetically about the land, even about the drainage tile that makes it arable. I've made a design showing both abstracted aerial and cross-section views of cultivated land. The quadrants represent Lear and his three daughters. The titling runs along the horizon line. Hard Scrabble is the memoir of Texas author John Graves' experiences on his farm, the history of the era, area and his efforts to rehabilitate the depleted land. The design is inspired by topographic maps, satellite photos, and the author's sketch of his farm. For a while, I was reading a lot of fiction and nonfiction about homesteading and the farming life. Willa Cather frequently mentions the tall native prairie grass, sometimes through a veil of blinding sun or whirling snow. This artist book includes a quote from Cather's My Antonia. Everywhere, as far as the eye could reach, there was nothing but rough, shaggy red grass. And there was so much motion in it. The whole country somehow seemed to be running. My night sky project is a good example of my process in researching a topic and turning the research into finished work. I began thinking about the project in 2001 after doing some traveling and realizing that unlike my suburban Chicago neighborhood, some places actually get dark at night and the stars are visible. The same stars that people have been looking at since the beginning of time. I began looking for quotes about the night sky from across the ages, reading history of astronomy books, books about exploration, navigation, and space travel, and essays and anthologies about the night sky. Reading all these books, looking for a few eloquent words strung together was incredibly time consuming. So I worked on this off and on for several years. Eventually, good online sources became available, and suddenly I had the opposite challenge, much too much information, screens and screens full of quotes to sift through. I also found high resolution public domain downloadable digital images of relevant historical illustrations. Meanwhile, I explored what ancient and modern people 
might be seeking when they look to the stars and what I might be looking for. Throughout the process, I made a number of models for, for what the book might become, at least 25 models. I'd work with placement of the text, experiment with which illustrations to use, the color of the background, or in what pattern the book should fold so they could function as a book to read, a sculpture, and a delightful object to play with. Ultimately, I split the content into two books, both using the same structure of a collection of hinged triangles. Folded to fit inside their dust jackets, the books can be held in the hand and read page by page like a traditional book. Removed from the jackets, the books can be folded into an infinite variety of sculptural shapes or unfolded flat to reference historical astronomical charts or contemporary NASA composite photos. The background of each is a photograph of the Milky Way. Like most of my artist books, they're inkjet printed. The first book, Celestial Navigation, is an illustrated catalog of ancient and modern navigational instruments. On the reverse of the pages, the Milky Way image is overlaid with a 19th century star chart and a poem about looking to the sky to reunite with one's lost love. The companion piece, Star Poems, presents quotes that document response to the night sky across the ages by philosophers, artists, and poets from Plato, Byron, and Van Gogh to more contemporary writers, scientists, and astronauts. Here the book is shown unfolded and flat. This text is paired with 17th century mythological images of constellation forms and images of early stargazers. Here the book is shown with its dust jacket oriented to be read as a traditional book. The overwhelming majority of my work is purchased by institutions rather than individuals. When possible, I like to also make a modest version that almost anyone who makes or admires artist books can afford. The budget version of Star Poems and Celestial Navigation features two quotes about the beauty of the stars and opens to reveal an image of an early stargazer against the night sky. Punched holes represent six constellations they appeared in the winter sky over North America on the opening night of the first time I exhibited this work. Design bindings are expressive bindings of an existing text. Almost always written by someone other than the author, the text is often finely printed sometimes lavishly illustrated, maybe a classic, maybe something more recent written by a widely beloved author, contemporary poetry, or anything the binder feels they can respond to. I continue to find inspiration in the Cold War, an undercurrent of my childhood that echoes for me in the rhetoric of the war on terror. This binding of Oppenheimer is Watching Me by Iowa writer Jeff Porter is inspired by the author's vignettes of growing up during the Cold War, both paranoia of nuclear attack and playful pop culture atomic references. On the inside of the book at the front and rear, executed in cheerful period colors, a hint of the unthinkable as the atom deconstructs. A book dealer friend thought I might be interested in this 1860 book about Sir John Franklin's doomed 1845 expedition to find the Northwest Passage. 
Both Franklin's ships became trapped in Arctic ice, were abandoned and lost with all their crew. Ever since, numerous follow-up expeditions have been made, first to search for survivors, later for the wreckage of the ships, and more recently, for Canada to map the area to strengthen their claim to their territorial waters in light of global warming. This binding gave me an opportunity to do research into historical exploration, shipwrecks, and sea ice and work with more elaborate inlays than I've done in the past. I covered images of historic shipwrecks with parchment to suggest looking through Arctic waters at the wreckage of the ships at the bottom of the sea. The wreckage of Franklin's Erebus was discovered in the fall of 2014 as I completed this binding. The next summer, his second ship, the Terror, was also found in very well-preserved condition. This finding of George Orwell's 1984 is one of my favorites. The spine features text from the novel. I don't draw, so text as image is a good design solution for me and works well with how I think and what stays with me as I'm reading. This binding is the bradle structure, which I'll mention later. The spine covering and boards are made as three separate pieces. Two thousand eighteen was the two hundredth anniversary of the publication of Frankenstein. And there were several juried exhibits at about that time with themes that would accommodate a design binding of the text. I started accumulating illustrated versions a few years in advance. The parchment I used here was produced during a workshop I took at Pergamina, a tannery in upstate New York. The modeled appearance is an artifact of the skin beginning to decompose before processing. I used a digital craft cutter to create the lightning stencil and through it applied a variety of metallic paints. Lately, I'm a lot more interested in modest functional structures than I am in elaborate full leather bindings. I learned a new conservation friendly limp binding structure from British binder Kathy Abbott and was eager to try it out, and also eager to use a selection of the parchment I've accumulated over the years. The scarred portion at right is deer from a friend's hunting husband. The upper left is veiny calf, and the brown is more goat I dyed myself in the workshop at Pergamina. Every year since 2017, I've been downloading and formatting a different public domain text to create printed text blocks for my students. If students only make blank books, they don't understand imposition and the urgency of keeping sections right side up and in the correct order. This year's book is a selection of Sherlock Holmes stories and my advanced leather binding students are working on that on Monday nights, all fall and into the winter. Next year will be Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse. At some point, I realized that to become both a better binder and a better book binding instructor, I'd need a deeper understanding of the engineering of the book. This quest has led to additional study, making numerous structure models and much written documentation of procedures. I've also learned a lot from teaching, having to describe rounding, backing, pairing and other basic skills in great detail and troubleshoot the students' difficulties has forced me to look much more carefully at what I'm doing and why. My recent work reflects my interest in the engineering aspects of binding and in historic structures. 
This interest is apparent not only in my bindings and teaching activities, but also in my artist books. In 2003, I took a workshop with Bonnie Stolliker at Paper Book Intensive, an annual summer workshop series where we sewed little text blocks using seven different techniques. The logical next step seemed to me to be a variety of ways to turn the text blocks into bindings. And every year I request such a workshop on my evaluation form. In 2009, I was asked to take a, teach a workshop to a group of printmakers in Massachusetts. And one of the topics they requested was how to get covers on our books. I realized that this was the board attachment workshop I'd been waiting for, but I was going to be the instructor, not one of the students. I thought of all the different binding structures I'd, I'd made or knew how to make building on what I'd already done and constructed about 20 models small enough to travel with. The models were only partially finished so the structure would remain visible. The group wanted to cover many topics over a long weekend so the board attachment component was lecture only. Right away, I realized I could turn the lecture material into a workshop where students would make their own cutaway models. I wanted to give book artists a little background in traditional binding skills, and I knew workshop students would love to have a set of darling little books. I observed that the workshop was attracting more practitioners than hobbyists, and some of the students had been sent there by their employers for professional development. I wondered if I could reuse the same material in a third way. Would institutions purchase a set of the models already made? I rewrote my workshop handout to turn the instructions for each structure into a guidebook pointing out key engineering features of each. This would give librarians something to talk about when using the models in presentations on the history of the book. I added an additional binding for a more satisfying total of 12 also making something available only in the set of models that was not available by taking the workshops. Finally, I made a standalone print-on-demand version of the guidebook. Following this protocol of workshop, model, print-on-demand manual, I've released a new structure or set of structures every few years. Another major project was a second set of structure models, 10 paper bindings. The models are accompanied by a 130 page manual of chapters on tools, supplies, ergonomics, and basic forwarding plus complete instructions for each structure. Both the manual and set of models were designed to assist librarians, printmakers, and others with limited binding experience to teach book binding. The manual is also available as a standalone publication that can serve as an introductory book binding textbook. I used one of the structures from the set here, a design binding and a paper wrapper. The multicolored foil tooling on handmade paper reflects the text, which follows the activities on a Kentucky farm through the seasons from autumn to autumn. When COVID changed the nature of my teaching opportunities, my work on this set of models and instructions left me well positioned to teach numerous one and two session online workshops to homebound hobbyists. In 2009, the Philadelphia Athenaeum issued a call for book artists to respond to selected works from their collection. 
At that time, three of the huge new houses on my street had been vacant for a long time and were in foreclosure, including the house right next door that had gone without utilities and upkeep for months. One day a service came to cut the knee-high grass in the yard and pump eight feet of water out of the basement. The model architect, the Panic of 09, is based on the model architect, Samuel Sloan's 1852 collections of grandiose house plans and instructions to contractors. The new work pairs historical text and illustrations from Sloan's archival work with contemporary texts from the US Department of Housing and Urban Development's online guide to avoiding foreclosure. The book is bound using the drum leaf structure, but is evocative of a mid 19th century binding in its use of materials and decorative elements. Leather spine, marble paper, decorated edge and gold tooling. The large page size mirrors that of Sloan's work. In the Colophon, I note that Samuel Sloan's The Model Architect was published at the midpoint of a century marked by cycles of rampant speculation followed by financial collapse. Not unlike the cycle that wreaked havoc with the real estate in my neighborhood and with the global economy. In doing research for a design binding of the Raven, I noticed how closely current events mirrored tales written by Edgar Allan Poe almost 200 years ago. Nevermore Again, Poe Exhumed, pairs 12 Poe stories with equally spine-tingling stories from the news. The premature burial and struggling economy, the balloon hoax and the hunt for weapons of mass destruction, a tale of the ragged mountains and politicians' dalliances in the Appalachian Mountains and beyond, the black cat and the bravado of a former Illinois governor, the man that was used up and the meteoric rise of a former Alaska governor. I enjoyed the research into historical styles I did for the model architect and went even further with Nevermore again. The typography and design are based on the first edition of Post's first published work, Tamerlane and Other Poems. Only 12 copies of this modest pamphlet are known to exist of the 50 printed in Boston in 1827. The standard edition of Nevermore Again is presented in a paper wrapper. The construction is based on the first edition of Tamerlane. The deluxe edition is presented in an early 19th century publisher's binding with custom marble paper by New Mexico marbler Pam Smith. On the left is an image of my book. On the right is an image of Tamerlane at the University of Chicago Library. A letterpress printed text by 18th century artist William Blake was the set book for a 2020 bookbinding competition. The text block is very modest, 32 pages of nitigan with one line of text printed on each. An equally modest binding structure seemed most appropriate, so I used a variation on Gary Frost's sewn boards binding a structure I researched and presented on at the Guild of Bookworkers annual conference in 2013. The text was challenging to connect with. It's a letter from Blake to a patron, full of excuses for Blake's lack of progress on a commission. I located the text online, printed it out and pinned it up in the studio and looked at it for weeks. As it became familiar, I began to highlight the most ridiculous phrases.
Over time, I came to love Blake's outrageous excuses and again used text as image for my design. This soundboard binding variation features a wraparound cover that unfolds to display a pompous panorama of Blake's excuses. As I worked on the design for the binding, I began planning how to reuse my work with the text in an addition to artist book. I looked for imagery online and found a copy of Night Thoughts illustrated by Blake. This illustration mirrors Blake's promise to chain my feet to the world of duty. The standard and deluxe are inkjet printed on handmade paper. The deluxe is bound as a period appropriate early 19th century publishers binding. I use the text yet again as headings for each page of a to-do list non-motivational phrases excusing one's inability to accomplish any task. Unabridged is made from one entire random house unabridged dictionary. It's more than an exercise in sewing endurance. The binding is stripped down to its most elemental structure, paper, linen, wood. Any ornamentation comes only from those materials. The pattern of the text, the tone and grain of the wood, the color of the thread and the sewing supports, which I made myself from linen thread using historical rope making techniques. For the book to function not only as a sculpture, but also as a structurally sound book, I had to strike a delicate balance between support and flexibility. At the beginning of March 2020, I could have told you what I'd be doing every week of the year and was even doing some preliminary planning for 2021. Just days later, all these plans had evaporated. A venue where I'd been scheduled to teach in person that June asked if I'd be willing to move the workshop online. Teaching online was something I hadn't done before and neither had they. So we shared in the research and figured out how to do it together. I began by testing Zoom with friends and taking a few online workshops to see what worked and what I thought could be improved. I realized it would be a lot like something I had already done successfully, presenting at the annual Guild of Bookworkers Conference where the sessions are three hour live demonstrations that are visible on big monitors in the auditorium and also recorded. Three principles were transferable from large, a large in-person presentation to teaching a group online. Make sure to keep what I'm doing in the frame. Prepare books in multiple stages to keep the demo moving. And have an assistant to manage questions and the text so I can focus on my demonstration. This gave me the confidence to plan a full schedule of online workshops that I'd host myself from my studio. Over the past months, I've acquired enough equipment that I can switch quickly between setups for different operations. A sewing setup with the webcam on a tripod gets me close enough that the project fills the frame. Note the colored thread to enhance visibility. Another setup allows me to get a close-up view of backing a text block. 
creative but not quite correct positioning of the text block and the job backer way over to one side instead of centered around the screw allows a tighter close up. Some procedures benefit from using extra large materials like sewing end bands with enormous number 12 thread instead of the usual thin silk. Conversely, I've had some smaller than usual sized equipment made to fit better in the cramped area under the webcam. And of course, the ubiquitous overhead camera. Mine is mounted on the chassis of an old photographic enlarger that had already been converted into a copy stand years ago. I'm happy that I've been able to reuse some items saved from my photography days. And that background informs the setup of my teaching workstation. Since June, I've hosted hundreds of students from six continents and 18 countries. Now I have a more spacious, more permanent work area, a dedicated computer with a large monitor and multiple webcams. The ergonomics of presenting for the camera are challenging and I keep working to refine what I can. I've revised many of my handouts to make them more useful apart from the workshop sessions since many of the students do at least some of their work between classes referring to the recording, but without me there to answer their questions. Sometimes a quick illustration will show at the camera can't. I'm really not much of a drafts person, but my students are eager that we all succeed and we're usually able to understand each other. Last year, I was asked to be part of the panel at the annual Guild of Bookworkers Conference on a topic I really didn't have much to say about. Meanwhile, I've been experimenting with the new binding structure and I suggested that I give a presentation on that instead. The structure is based on a 2017 work by British binder, Jem Lindsay. It shares some features with the simplified and three-piece bradle bindings. A separate spine wrapper is attached to reinforced end sheets and the boards are attached to that flange. The structure differs from its cousins in that the sewing supports lace through the spine wrapper to provide both an adhesive and a mechanical attachment to the text block. The lacing provides crisp, even foolproof positioning of the spine wrapper, head to tail and side to side. The lacing can also be a design element if the binder uses colored sewing supports. This binding is much more streamlined than the related structures I've mentioned. There are no turn-ins at the spine, head, and tail. Sometimes I add a thin rolled end band, but often not. Joins between materials are neat, but no more pairing, sanding, lining, or infilling need be done than is necessary for the book to function. This leaves the structure of the completed binding easily discernible. The elegance imbued by the binding's visible structure has a kinship with the International School of Architecture as seen here in Mies van der Rohe's Farnsworth House outside Chicago. Just steel, glass, and engineering. I believe the structure compares favorably with the traditional fine binding.
I've been using this structure for many of my recent bindings and it lends itself well to what I'll talk about next. In the spring of 2020, a good friend was encouraging others to join him in working with fish parchment, a material he'd been experimenting with for several years. I really wasn't very interested, but I wanted to support my friend. The deadline for an online exhibit of work made with artist processed fish skin gave me something to work towards during the lockdown before I discovered online teaching. Trying something new will put you in contact with new people and maybe new communities. You might start to look at for familiar materials, tools, and processes in different ways and see possibilities you didn't know existed. Acknowledging that you're experimenting can take off pressure to produce or to work it to an unrealistically high level of craft. You'll always learn something new to take back to your studio practice even if it's not exactly the new skill or material you were experimenting with. I'll keep teaching online at least through 2023 continuing to offer intermediate and advanced level multi-session workshops that I organize myself and simpler single session workshops through a variety of book arts organizations. Workshops through next year are posted on my website along with 25 years of bindings and artist books and handouts and models from previous workshops. And that's it. So thank you for your attention this morning. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm going to stop the share now. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Oh, well, you're welcome. That was a lot of information. Um, what well, such art, art you do. I mean, it's amazing. Those, oh, those findings. Um, I just had a quick question about uh, those fish bindings. Did you actually um, tan it yourself or you you got the fish fish skins or how'd you do that? So I did all that. I'll share again. Um, they make beautiful covers. Um, hmm. Okay, so um, I go to the fish counter at the grocery store and yeah. I used to ask the fish person to skin it for me, but I'm learning to do that myself. Then I found that um, if you start it correctly, you can probably just tear it off. Um, they'll, you'll lose a lot of the flesh, but that's okay because fish is not popular to eat with the other member of my household. So um, if it's a little less fish at the end to go in the freezer, that's cool. Um, <laughs> And I imagine that Jaden knows all about this from the mammal side, so it's it's similar, but um, you scrape off all the flesh and then on the other side, scrape off all the scales. Um, and in between, in between times, put it in some soapy water to start cutting down on the oil. And then I stop it before it come, becomes leather. So I'm just pinning it out to dry naturally. 
um, if I were to tan it, it would go into another bath after that for um, probably several days, changing the bath, and then something would happen at the end to make it pliable. But parchment is not pliable. So I'm done after I pin it out like this. So the pinning, it just dries it out naturally, and then you can use it. That right. Way. It would kind of, um, it would just take its own shape and kind of curl up or shrivel up. So it's pinned out under tension. Okay. Wow. I love the books you made with it. Um, oh, the, thank the you. textures were wonderful with that. I, is that fish skins hanging in the background? Yeah, um, there was one I couldn't get the oil off of. So I need to take it out and hit it with some acetone, but I don't really like that. So I've been avoiding it. So um, it's just hanging up there. So it's not next to anything, getting something else oily. Oh, wow. Well, and that one's dyed in cochineal. So it would have been, if you don't do anything, um, it's kind of looks like a black and white negative or maybe a little brown tone to it. So no matter what the fish look like, it loses that color when you make parchment from it. Okay. Wow. Karen, we have cochineal here in Arizona. I, I'm sorry, I don't know what state you're in. And I'm outside Chicago. Okay, and then you had some that had sort of a yellow tone to it. What are you using for that natural dye? Oh gosh, um, I used marigold. Um, I used a bunch of different things, and they're just—I can't remember off the. You know, you're kind of in an altered state when you're doing a lecture. Um, I can't remember everything right now, but there are full descriptions of all those books on my website, so it'll say. Okay, and then when you take the fish skin and you stretch it once it's dried out, I would think it would get brittle um but you're able to form it around the book cover or? oh no it's really 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 strong there's a guy tim barrett at university of iowa he wrote a one of macarthur grant a few years back he's a paper maker and peter got tim barrett to test the paper the uh, parchment in the machine that tests paper hmm. and it just folded back and forth, back and forth. It's stronger than the strongest paper that he makes. It's much stronger than skin from a mammal. So it's really strong. Interesting, thank you. One more question. Your um, book that you call Unabridged, which was the dictionary. Yeah. You, what position or tools do you use when you stitch that? Because it's so long, I would think it's unwieldy. Uh, it's sewn on cord, so I use a sewing frame. Okay. And um, if I do the whole, if I do a whole dictionary, then I really need one of the old-fashioned ones that are always so enormous. Um, modern ones aren't quite that big. I don't think I've ever seen one, and I wondered how you managed it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't have one that I can. Oh, okay. Something like this. Oh, this okay. Was taken in 1900. Wow. So I just put on an outfit like that and I. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have other questions or comments? Um, please unmute yourself and um, ask Karen um, about her work. This, this is Lori Moorhead. I just want to say, Karen, um, I'm looking forward to your triangle book uh, workshop a little bit later in the month with um, through the Minnesota. Uh, right. Center. We emailed yesterday or the day. Yes, before. yes, we yes. I'm the one who keeps going. But but I don't understand <laughs> only because I I'm I'm now at my my house in in Kauai. So I had to bring everything with me. So I wanted to make sure that I had what I needed. But you were. I just want to tell everyone, Karen is very prompt and very helpful when you have questions before a workshop, and I'm looking forward to it. Great. Yeah. Sounds wonderful. 
I had a question. Um, when you make your um, design bindings for books that um, from authors that have already uh, like Jane Smiley, whatever, are you making just one of those? Or are you, do you have like, how many do you make? And um, are, is the author asking you to make that binding, co the cover for it? Or how, do, how does that work? It's like so, when you did Dracula. Uh, and, uh, the same as if Paperworks had a call for entries for some kind of exhibit. There would be exhibits that would be devoted to design bindings or book arts exhibits where that kind of thing would not be out of place. Or sometimes it's a commission. Or if I want to just keep working on my skills, maybe I'll just do one. I see. So it's usually just one of a kind then. Usually. Yeah, maybe one of a kind. Okay. So um, maybe maybe a printer, a letterpress printer would want, I don't know, 10 of their large edition done in some fancy way. So you might get a small edition of them that way. I see. Okay. But usually one of a kind. Okay. Okay. Uh, that they're beautiful. They're wonderful. So I learned a lot. Um, yeah. I'm sure special collections at your university would have some, you know, not some of mine, but somebody's, I'll bet the librarian would be really glad to find some. Sure. Yeah. We've been there before we've done programs there. So that's true. We could um, take a look. And I was just wondering if you made the in mass, like a uh, hundred or you had orders for them beforehand, but um, I was curious about that. Yeah, never more than one per person at a time. <laughs> okay. um, I think you're a wonderful teacher. I mean, I haven't taken a class from you, but the people that took when you were here in Paperworks um, several years ago, they just said you were wonderful. I, I think you taught, uh, was it drum leaf binding at the time? It was the flag book. Flag book you taught. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't here then, but um, anyway, that's that's wonderful. Um, I know Mary Jane Henley was one person in that class, and she was going to come today. I don't know if she's here. But... Yeah, she was the one who drove me all around. Okay. Yeah, I had a really good time with her. <laughs> Great. Great. Um, anybody else have any comments or questions for Karen? Um, your work is amazing and you are a very organized and just the craft is just um, wonderful. It's oh, amazing to you. see. And it's also cool how you've adapted to Zoom, teaching on Zoom, um, which for a lot of people would have given up, you know? I wouldn't have done it if Marnie at the Marriott Library hadn't said, let's try this. I would have thought, I don't know how to do this. I can't possibly do this. As we all did when we were first asked to go to a Zoom meeting, right? Right, right. No, I know. <laughs> well, you didn't or, so, Jaden, were you taking your classes? You must have been taking your classes on Zoom for a couple of years. Yeah, so I took a break for the first year because the courses were too challenging for me to take online. I need to mm -hmm. be in person. And then the last year, I started taking classes again. Um, and we just, campus just opened up last fall, so it's just been a year of in-person, but yeah, for a year, I was online. Yeah, if it's a difference between doing what you love or doing what you need to do to take care of your family or not, then you figure out how to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just if wanted it sounds to... noble, it's just a laptop with a camera. <laughs> I just wanted to... Um, ask you if you are following what happened, I think yesterday in uh, at the US Supreme Court, which were, where they were debating um, the um, idea of um, uh, artists who are adapting, you know, work from other people, photographs from, you know, one person and, you know, making them into their own um, adaptations. 
And it was a, uh, the, the, the little clips that I heard yesterday were quite interesting because there was some, um, there was some humor in what has been, you know, sometimes like very contentious. And, but the, you know, but the, the, the debate is um, quite pertinent to taking something from a one artist and interpreting it um, to another art form. And you, you might want to, you know, just, I don't know if you follow that, but. It, yeah, it, the Andy Warhol thing, right? Yeah, I'm, not right. Up to, I'm not up to date on that. Yeah. They, they expect that they'll have a, a ruling by the, I guess by the end of this term, which I don't even know when that is, but it, but um, it sounded, it anyway, it sounded like an interesting debate. Sometimes it takes them like six months, right? So that's, that's pretty quick for them. Great. Anybody else? I know um, uh, Karen has to teach pretty soon, right? Um, has to, has to get. Yeah, I told them 12, 15. Yeah. Because I didn't want to rush out yeah. of here. Yeah. Well, we wish you could be here in person. It's lovely here right now, but I'm sure it's lovely back in Illinois uh, at the same time. So it's, it's lovely-ish. Lovely-ish. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> uh, well, we're having good weather here uh, also. So anybody else? Anything to say? Well, Karen's website, we've listed it there. We'll list it um, in our e-news and also on our webpage. And you can contact her and see the classes that she is teaching um, online, which would be great. So um, I am going to stop recording now. We thank you very much, Karen, so much for talking to us and hope you can visit us again sometime. Um, and I'm going to stop recording.